Welcome to the Center for Court Innovation's short training series on helping court staff understand domestic violence cases. This is part one. What's going on? Why is it important for court staff to understand what's going on in cases involving domestic violence? Even if you're not the one giving legal advice, court staff still plays a critical role. They're often the first contact litigants have with the justice system after a domestic violence incident. And a litigant's first experience in court can hugely impact their decision-making moving forward. How do you ensure that you're responding in the best way you can? And what can you do to make survivors feel safe and welcome in the courthouse? Every day, hundreds of domestic violence incidents take place across the country. In the United States, one in four women and one in 10 men experience domestic violence in their lifetime. Domestic violence hotlines typically receive over 19,000 calls per day. And on average, it takes a survivor seven attempts to leave an abusive relationship before leaving permanently. Let's start off by testing your current knowledge about domestic violence. Don't worry if you get anything wrong. We'll review all the answers. Most incidents of domestic violence are the result of poor anger management and a loss of self-control by the abusive partner. Yes? No, or maybe. The correct response is no. Most incidents of domestic violence are centered on the exertion of power and control by the person who causes harm to the victim, exhibited through physical, emotional, sexual, financial, and or psychological violence. People who cause harm attempt to use court, the legal process, additional services, and others to control survivors and their children. Yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer is maybe, and even yes. People who cause harm through domestic violence may and often do use these systems as a vehicle to stalk the survivor or as an opportunity to harass and manipulate the survivor, their children, and other family and friends court staff and other justice system professionals must remain vigilant towards potential abuse. Lethal violence occurs more frequently during and after separation than when the victim and abusive partner are still together. Yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer is yes. The person who abuses often continues acts of abuse at significant rates after separation sometimes increasing in severity. Separation often signifies the end of a relationship, but for many adult victims of domestic violence, separation marks an escalation of violence and manipulative tactics by the person who causes harm. These tactics often continue at significant rates post-separation and may become even more severe. Children can also be targets or witnesses to the violence. Although there are different risk assessment tools available for domestic violence cases, it can be difficult to predict in which case or under what circumstances the adult victim and the children are at risk. Engaging with people who use violence is risky and can lead to further harm for adult victims and their children. Yes, no, or maybe. The correct answer is maybe. Positive engagement of the people causing harm can potentially change their violent behaviors and attitudes, which will enhance the well-being of survivors and their families. This engagement is a key component to ending family violence. However, it is critical to maintain limits, boundaries, policies, and procedures that center survivor safety and prevent manipulation and further abuse. Let's take a deeper look at domestic violence. What exactly is it? Essentially, domestic violence is abusive behavior in a relationship. It can be physical, emotional, sexual, financial, and or psychological in nature. It can feel very different to different people. It's important to remember that domestic violence can happen to anyone, regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, religion, socioeconomic status, or gender. Underserved and marginalized populations are particularly vulnerable to domestic violence, including the elderly, teenagers, 
individuals with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ community, among others. Domestic violence incidents tend to fall into three categories, coercive control, resistive or reactive, or situational. Let's take a look at each of these. Coercive control centers on the exertion of power and dominance by one person over another. This type of domestic violence involves a pattern of controlling behavior rather than an isolated incident. This is what professionals refer to when they talk about domestic violence due to the risk of escalating violence and even fatality. Coercive control may not always revolve around physical violence. It might include things like monitoring all the finances and taking the survivor's paycheck, minimizing the survivor's feelings or always blaming and belittling them, cutting them off from their friends and family and socially isolating them, intimidating and threatening the survivor with violence, and many other behaviors. What about other types of domestic violence? Sometimes courts might see resistive or reactive violence. This behavior is shaped by the coercive control. Meaning, rather than instigating the abuse, an individual is resisting or reacting to their partner's controlling and violent behaviors, with violence as well. These cases can be tricky for courts and often mislabeled as mutual violence, which implies that both parties are using violence similarly and neither party is in greater danger. There's also situational domestic violence. These types of incidents are not linked to pattern of abuse, but rather isolated incidents that haven't happened before. While this type of behavior is still violent, it may not be necessary for courts to take the same safety precautions compared to cases involving coercive control. So why is this information important for court staff to understand? As previously mentioned, court staff are often the first contact litigants have with the justice system after a domestic violence incident, and that first experience in the courthouse can have huge repercussions on their decision-making moving forward including whether survivors return and continue with their petition. We know court staff has a distinct role. While you may not be deciding case outcomes or providing legal advice to litigants, it's critical for court staff to understand the context of domestic violence and assess any safety issues and risks for families coming into the court for help. Determining the context of the domestic violence involves exploring three questions. Why is the person causing harm engaging in the violence? Are they trying to control the survivor? Are they reacting to their partner's violence? Is it the first time anything like this has ever happened? What does it mean to the survivor? Is the survivor fearful for their safety, the safety of their children or their family? Do they believe the violence will escalate or even lead to lethality? And finally, what is the effect of the violence? What impact does it have on the survivor, their family, and the larger community? Determining context is not meant, nor should it be used, to justify, excuse, or rationalize the abusive behavior. Rather, it helps court staff determine appropriate interventions, resources, and safety planning for litigants. For example, will the survivor need a security escort to their vehicle? Do they need to speak to an advocate or be referred to culturally specific service providers? Are they under immediate danger or pressure that could prevent them from returning to the next court date? So what else can you do in your role as court staff? Try your best to treat individuals with dignity and respect each and every interaction. Court is often a stressful place for both litigants and staff, specifically with domestic violence cases. Oftentimes, court staff is responding to dozens of cases all day long. Respect can have a huge impact on the litigant's perception of the court process and whether they're willing to return. Refer litigants to any additional services they may need, including community-based advocates, legal aid, social services, workforce development, and others that can help provide support and bridge gaps and implement a feedback process to learn about where you and other court staff can enhance your policies and practices in domestic violence cases. Finally, ongoing training and support on domestic violence will help staff safely and effectively respond to domestic violence cases. When you work with individuals seeking relief on domestic violence cases, 
you may not ever know the exact type of violence they're experiencing. The information they tell you or the details they put into the petition is usually just a fraction of what's actually been going on. But the more training you and other court staff receive, the better equipped you'll be to keep your courthouse safe for everyone. To learn more about this topic and for any further training questions, contact us at dvinfo at courtinnovation.org.